Well, I'm excited to be joined by Muhammad Ibrahim, a native Egyptian who grew up in the shadows of the pyramids. He's also a renowned Egyptologist, a soon-to-be author, and a famous tour guide who's actually going to be hosting our Megalithic Marvels of Egypt tour this May. Muhammad, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome, Dean. It's always a pleasure to uh, show your uh, to join your show. I'm really excited to get to see you in May for our tour, and I know you, you alluded to some surprises you've got. So, anything you want to tell people out there that might be thinking about joining us about why they should, real quick. The name of the tour itself is a very good reason to uh, make people join the tour. Uh, we are going to focus in, in this tour on uh, so many uh, exciting sites, and we will focus on the big uh, structures and the megalithic uh, statues. And of course, that will lead us to talk about the ancient Egyptian uh, high technology and the ancient Egyptian uh, advanced knowledge. So we will explain Egypt from a completely different perspective. Yes, we may explain some history, uh, some kind of uh, ancient uh, religion, but we will focus on the uh, techniques, uh, how the ancient Egyptians built these megalithic structures. That is one of the kind. You'll find that uh, most of the tours, they uh, focus on uh, like one day or two days about uh, uh, this uh, type of information. But in our tour every day, we will dive deep into the Egyptian history and not only this, but we will talk also about the possibility of the existence of uh, uh, Egyptian civilizations before 10,500 BC. That is plus high quality accommodation, high quality food, transportation, all the service will be in a very good uh, quality. Well said, yeah. And anybody, you can go to megalithicmarvels.com forward slash tours to get all the information. And uh, we hope to see you. So, Muhammad, I want to start out in this interview uh, asking you about the most ancient of Egyptian myths and origins. Um, on our last tour, you you kind of were educating us about Zeptepi. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell people who may not be familiar with this, tell us a little bit about Zeptepi and how this correlates to the civilizations before 10,000 BC? The ancient Egyptians left um, many stories for us, and these stories are called the uh, creation story. Uh, when I was studying uh, as a student at the university, ancient Egypt, and was studying the ancient Egyptian religion, and by the way, that is one of the things we are going to, to fix, uh, uh, one of the informations we will fix during the tour, that this type of story is not related to the ancient Egyptian religion. It talks about uh, physics, it talks about astronomy, it talks about uh, great science. But unfortunately, they claim that Zeb Tebi, or some people sometimes call it Zeb Tebi, they claim that this is a, a story about religion or religious story. The ancient Egyptians left us four stories about how the universe was created, not how mankind, not how animals, not it's not about our solar system only or even galaxy. No, it talks about the, the entire universe. And they left us four interesting stories. If you put them together, it will create one major story. And from the, that big story, we will understand what happened millions or billions of years ago. So Zeb Tebi means the first time or the moment uh, the first moment of creation. The first time, that is what some people call it the Big Bang or the Nova Star or the, uh, the, the kind of activation led to the creation of the universe, um, uh, billions of galaxies and uh, billions of billions of or trillions of stars and planets. So uh, one of the stories called the Inyat, it talks about nine major meters and when I was saying they relate this story to uh, the religious uh, aspect of ancient Egypt, they call them uh, nine gods, but I call them nine netters. And the word netter, it doesn't mean God, it means force of nature. And there is another story called the Ogdad, eight netters. And then the story of Betah, 
and the story of Amun. Each one is responsible to explain to us one of the uh, sides, or let's say one of the aspects of the situation before creation. Like the uh, story of the Ogdad, it talks about the eight elements before creation. We talk about darkness, we talk about light, we talk about space, we talk about emptiness, uh, male and female. Uh, the story of uh, Bitah, it talks about sound and how the creation was activated by sound. The story of Amun, it talks about the uh, main element of creation. The story of the Inyad, it compromise that all in, in uh, physical form. And then the first uh, things started to be created one after the other, okay? So uh, many people, unfortunately, they see it as separate uh, stories, uh, separate uh, mythologies, but no, I see it as one big story divided to four pieces. So Zip Tibi is the word uh, and by the way, Zip Tibi, in my opinion, is not the very old uh, date or, or not the earliest word we, we must look for. Now, there is older than Zip Tibi, before the creation. What would the story before the creation? So Zip Tibi means the first time. Incredible. Yeah. Um, Robert Bouval, I believe, proposed a correlation between the Giza pyramids and the three largest stars of the Orion belt. Um, he suggested that there's a perfect alignment, you know, between um, that goes back before 10,000 uh, BC. Any thoughts on that? Do you believe that the great pyramids of Giza, the three once aligned with the stars of Orion? Look, if we say that and we stop, or we don't uh, talk more about this, maybe it, it will be a questionable uh, story or a questionable opinion. And many people will say, maybe other people will say no. And it will be um, an information subjected to uh, deny, the, the, to be denied or to be accepted. But if I add to this story that the ancient Egyptians didn't uh, focus only on, on that part, but uh, for your knowledge that the ancient Egyptian made a huge list for uh, the, uh, the stars they could see uh, for uh, the uh, different galaxies. Many galaxies were listed, by the way, in the ancient Egyptian writing. Some we managed to identify like Ethiopia. Some we didn't uh, manage to uh, identify, we don't know, but we know that it is a galaxy, but under what modern name, we don't know. Um, there is the, the word Deshret, uh, uh, Her Deshret or Deshret or Her, the Red Horus, that is for Mars. We know the word Jupiter also related to Horus, uh, Venus, uh, Saturn. So the ancient Egyptian gave names to these uh, planets. Uh, when we talk about Sirius, the ancient, my, in my opinion, nobody uh, studied or uh, made records for uh, serious movement uh, more than the ancient Egyptians. Uh, for Orion, as you said, and they uh, represented Orion as uh, Osiris. Osiris uh, in, in the sky was his uh, harpoon, uh, and they made the, uh, the equivalent of Sirius uh, as Isis, Sobdit. So not only uh, a picture, but they give names to these stars. So uh, Orion was called Sahu, uh, Sirius was called Sobdit. So we are uh, looking to a huge study, uh, or we can call it great science, uh, was left uh, by the ancient Egyptians to us. And uh, when we talk about the, the three stars, uh, the Orion built, in my opinion, of course, uh, Robert Tuval. Um, uh, made great discovery uh, when he was talking about this, and I agree with him 100%. But in my opinion, this is still like less than 1% of what we must study, what we must understand from the ancient Egyptian knowledge about the stars and about the uh, universe. Interesting. Um, Robert Edward Grant was sharing with me how Leonardo da Vinci called the 
pyramids way back in his day. Uh, I think it was Mount Taurus, which means Bull Mountain. Um, can you tell me anything more about this ancient name before, you know, Giza, Bull Mountain? And I think this might correlate with the Egyptian underworld. Can you tell us anything about that? Okay. I will be humble <laughs> when I'm explaining this because uh, I'm the only one can explain it this way. Uh, it needs first to, to understand some points and then, then it will lead you to this meaning. There is a word called Bia in Bet. Bia in Bet, we can explain it or it, it literally if you open the uh, dictionary from uh, ancient uh, Egyptian vocabulary, you'll find that word Bia in Bet means meteorite, or we can call it the iron of the sky, okay? And iron of the sky here has two meanings. Some explain it as a meteorite, falling meteorites, okay? Or as I explain it, the ancient Egyptians were talking about the source of iron on the ground, that it is extraterrestrial source. It is not, uh, we all know that iron uh, is not, uh, form was not formed naturally, on the ground, okay, because the, it needs a kind of uh, temperature doesn't exist in our solar system. So maybe they talk about uh, real meteorites or they talk about the uh, origin of iron on Earth. Uh, Bian Bet is also a name for, uh, we, we they call Bian Bet at the bull of the sky, okay. And Osiris, one of the titles of Osiris is the bull of the sky also. And the story say that Osiris was killed and was buried and he the first mummy and the first one was put in a coffin and then sarcophagus. So we understand that Bia in Pet will eventually uh, lay down or be inside this sarcophagus, okay? So, this is, can lead us to understand or to know that maybe the uh, one of the functions of these granite boxes is to house this magnetic iron. Okay, uh, so that will lead us to what to Apis, the Apis pool, the famous story at uh, the Serapium. So they we we uh, read in history books that they bury the Apis pool inside these boxes. What if? that this abyss bull, we mistakenly think it is real bull. Well, it is no, it is the bull of the sky, the uh, magnetized iron, okay? This abyss bull takes the shape or one of the, uh, the if, if we uh, represent the, this word uh, in the Egyptian, uh, ancient Egyptian symbols, it takes the shape like, uh, like an angle, like an, an arrow head. Okay, like uh, upside down V, double V above each other. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, two. If you look to the uh, Great Pyramid, to the uh, real entrance, the original entrance, you will see this sign at, at the gate, at, at, on top of the entrance. Okay, so as if the Great Pyramid is hiding the name Api, or which the Greeks call it Apis, it's originally Happy. So the entrance, it shows us the, that symbol, happy, the bull. So the Great Pyramid itself is hiding or including that word happy. So the uh, Giza Plateau, and, and someone can say, maybe all the pyramids are like this, no. If you check some other pyramids, you may see similar, okay? But one stone, not two. And the word happy has two, not just one uh, a triangle, okay? So that is my uh, input about uh, how we named the area uh, uh, Rostau. Uh, and according to Robert Grant, if we read it uh, backwards, it, it re reads uh, Taurus. So, Mohammed, you're one of the, again, you, you, you're a native Egyptian. You grew up in the shadow of the pyramids. Um, you're a, a studied Egyptologist. But you're one of the very few Egyptologists who uh, believe that somebody before the dynastic Egyptians of 3000 BC built these 
pyramids and a lot of the megalithic temples and statues that we'll get into. So my que- my next question, Muhammad, is what were the things you saw? What were the clues that that led you to actually not just believe, but to to declare publicly that I think somebody before the dynastic Egyptians built a lot of the megalithic stuff? Okay. Um, this is very uh, important question. We can talk about ancient technologies for many years, okay? But we will not come to this conclusion because we can, uh, the, the, uh, the situation here is uh, divided into two branches. The first branch is to first, is to uh, prove the existence of these technologies and that these sites and these uh, huge blocks, and by the way, we are talking about blocks, uh, is or limestone blocks or uh, granite or even alabaster, okay, or quartzite or conglomerate. We are talking about blocks from two tons, five tons and 10 tons, which I call it the baby size to 50 tons, 100 tons, and 300 tons, and 500 tons, till 1,200 tons. And I'm very uh, conservative when I talk about the uh, the, the last uh, weight, because a statue, uh, like what we call it, Memnon statue, the estimate weight uh, is about 700 tons. That is from red quartzite. That is the, the weight of the statue after it was made. But let's imagine when it was one big block because the statue is seated the statue. So the statue lost part from above the knees all the way to the head. That is almost like one third of the size of the block. So if we add one third, so we talk about more than uh, 1000 tons. What on the statue will have uh, uh, the name Ramses II at Ramasium at the West Bank of Luxor the estimate weight is around 1,000 tons. So we can do the same thing. We can add between 300 tons to 500 tons to the block when it was cut from the quarry, okay? So we talk about massive size of blocks. No way to imagine that there is, a, and, and I'm talking about modern days, I'm not even talking about the ancient days, that there is a way now to cut and to, to move and to shape these giant blocks. And that is not my uh, opinion. That is the opinion of hundreds of engineers. I was flying to Luxor uh, two months ago and the the one was sitting next to me uh, on the flight was an Egyptian engineer, civil engineer, uh, constructions and things like this. And I had a conversation with him and telling him about these blocks the man was looking to me completely amazed as if he, that was his first time to know about uh, these facts. And I asked him that question straight. Do we have a way or, or a, a tool or a, a machine can carry 1,000 tons? He looked at me and he left and said, definitely not. Okay. So that is the first thing that, yes, we can easily prove that there was ancient advanced technology. But we can say these technologies existed during the uh, dynastic time. And when you say dynastic, we talk about 3000 BC to 300 BC, or existed before dynasties, because there is a, an era, we call it pre-dynastic, uh, 9000 BC to 3000 BC. For sure, 100%, they were primitive people. All the, not all, most of the products they left and their uh, equipments are primitive. So we can call them the cavemen, okay? But they left with these very primitive uh, equipments, they left very high quality equipments, very fancy jars from hard stones. And that is the problem. They did very primitive pottery jars, very, uh, I will not call it very ugly, but let's say handmade, uh, it doesn't show any uh, uh, symmetrical uh, proportions. It, it doesn't show any high quality because the pottery wheel 
uh, were invented during the second, the time of the second dynasty. So all the, the pottery products from the pre-dynastic were made by hands. So how come they invent in this super quality, not just high quality, super quality jars from alabaster, from diorite, from granite diorite, from uh, granite, and some products from amethyst, from uh, lapis lazuli, and from gold. Okay, and some fine flint tools. I know flint tools it will take us immediately to the story of primitive man and the, uh, the, the very early times. But when you check these uh, high quality flint tools, you will understand that these tools were made by uh, very high quality uh, advanced tools. So that is my first evidence, the existence of uh, super quality objects during the time of very primitive people. So the solution that these people, of course, didn't do it, didn't make it, but they found it. And if they found it, it was found because an earlier civilization made them. The second important evidence is geology. Uh, we have the, uh, the famous story about the age of the Sphinx, it was presented by John Anthony West and uh, Dr. Robert, uh, Robert Chuck. Uh, and according to the erosions above the body of the Sphinx, which we used to think it is uh, wind erosions, and they said, no, it is water erosions. So the, the famous question, Egypt is not uh, a country with too much rain. Egypt is dry weather from 9,000 BC. So we don't have that amount of rain can create or can uh, be the reason of like semi-flood or running water in Giza Plateau, and it can do such erosions on the body of the Sphinx. The only solution that this can happen at 9,700 BC, the rainy season at the time of the last ice age. So that means that the Sphinx was already there at that date, 9,700 BC. So it was built before this date. And when we say before, so we talk about 10,000 BC, 20,000 BC, maybe 80,000 BC. And there is another important story, the story of the solar disaster, which happened on our uh, solar system and affected Earth. Uh, and you can read that in the book of Dr. Uh, Lavalayette, Earth under fire. And he talks about that disaster which happened at 10,500 BC. The very interesting thing about that story, it matches an ancient Egyptian story, which we call it the, like one of the myth, myth of ancient uh, Egypt, uh, Sekhmet story. And the ancient, and we call it the destruction of mankind. If you uh, take the, the, the names like Sekhmet, Ra, uh, and we replace it with the sun, the solar flare, heat waves, it will give you the exact same story of Dr. Lavalet. Okay, so these are the three main reasons uh, make me believe that there was uh, earlier civilizations. And by the way, I used to think it was one early advanced civilization. Now I think there are many not just one. I'm glad you bring up this ancient pottery or these vessels, because on our last tour, you pointed that out. Uh, you can see a lot of these vases uh, in these museums. And again, the point I want to hit home here that you're making, Muhammad, is that what we're looking at, what you're referring to are these precision machine-like cut granite vases. Um, and you look close, and I mean, the lip around these uh, vessels is absolute precision. Um, yet the mainstream says that this was made by the pre-dynastic people who they also say were primitive. Like you said, they didn't even have the pottery wheel yet. Exactly. So right there, it's clear that they inherited this stuff. They just had it with them and kept it and were using it. It was had to be made earlier. Well, Muhammad, this has been a insightful interview. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, real quick, tell us about your forthcoming book. Real, what is it, what's it going to be about, and how can people find it when it's done? 
the name of the book is uh, Egypt Before Written History. It talks about Egypt millions of years ago, and then all the ages, geological eras, and then historical eras. And I talk about the lost uh, technologies and uh, the advanced uh, uh, tools. Uh, the book is going to be published very soon. I believe it will be published uh, like around April or May. Uh, uh, the book will be uh, published in the uh, United States. Uh, Billy Carson is my publisher. Uh, it, I believe it will be available on Amazon. Okay, so it will be easy for the uh, Americans to find the book online or to get a hard copy. It will be a very interesting book, by the way. Yeah, I cannot wait for this book to come out because I just I want to use it as a reference guide for all of this. Um, so that's exciting. Congratulations. The book's coming out. And when it does, we'll definitely feature it for you everywhere. OK, thank you. Well, Mohammed, thanks so much again for your time. And I look forward to seeing you this May on our Egypt tour. Yeah, me too. I can't wait to start this great tour. <laughs>